Good morning, Woodlawn family. So good to see all of you today. Thank you for taking the time to worship with us here today from uh, wherever you might have uh, come from. We're so glad that you took the time to be with us this morning on this Veterans Day weekend. Um, As you saw in that video there, uh, God has been faithful. Uh, He has been faithful to our church over the last uh, many decades, and uh, it's been wonderful to be a part of it and to see what the Lord is doing. Uh, As you've seen and experienced, our church has grown a lot, and we're very excited about the Lord leading us. Uh, We're going to be opening, in March of this coming year, we're going to be opening another location uh, at Jackson High School, so we're really excited about all the things that God is doing. But um, this morning, what I am so very thankful for, this is uh, Veterans Day weekend, and how many of y'all are thankful for all of our veterans that have served our nation so bravely? So... As a matter of fact, if you are here this morning, if you wouldn't mind, I won't embarrass you too much, but uh, if you're here and you served in the armed forces, if you are a veteran, would you just lift up your hand long enough for us to see it? Could we all just give these men and women a big hand clap? Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you've done. Those of you that are home that have served, we thank you as well. You know, I am uh, so thankful uh, to be living here in the United States of America. When I look around the world and I see how other people live and I see the freedoms that we have uh, in America, we have the freedom to assemble here. We have the freedom to speak our minds. And uh, I don't know about you, but I am so thankful to live in a country where we're able to do that. But this is what I'll tell you, that didn't come cheaply, that came at a price. And uh, the freedoms that we have to worship, to chase our dreams, to live our lives came because there were people, men and women, who gave their lives, who fought to defend our freedom, and who today are on duty right now making sure we can gather here safe. I don't know about you, but I am so, so very thankful. And when we pray this morning, I do want to just pray a prayer of blessing over our country and, and our nation and all of our, all of our veterans this morning. And uh, we also want to welcome our online audience in today. We have quite an audience that tunes in every week. Can we all just give them a big welcome too? You're part of us. We want to thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. Um, We are wrapping up a series today. This is week number seven of a series uh, on the book of Nehemiah called Rise Up and Build. It's very appropriate with us uh, getting ready to build and open a a new uh, location uh, over at Jackson High School. A lot been happening here with that, and we're excited about that. A lot more is going to be coming as we round up the year and head into next year. Um, But in saying all that, this has been an incredible uh, book and a book study because the life of Nehemiah is fascinating. Because he is just an ordinary guy. I don't know about you, but I'm just an ordinary guy, right? Um, he's just an ordinary guy that uh, felt the call of God upon his life. He was the cupbearer to the king in Persia. He heard that his people were struggling, the Jewish people in Jerusalem, that the walls were broken down. He began to pray. He began to fast. He began to seek God. And God turned that compassion he had for his people into a calling. God called a young man who'd never done construction, who'd never built a wall before. God called that young man to go a thousand miles away and do really the impossible. That he partnered with God and God did the impossible. And it's a pretty cool story. And today as we wrap the story up, um, I'm going to talk to you today about finishing well. You know, life is not so much about what we start, but life is about what we finish. And uh, the people that I most respect in life are people who were finishers. In fact, there's a a great pastor, a great man of God by the name of Tommy Barnett. He's still co-pastor as his son runs the church in Phoenix, Arizona. I think he's 85. He's still going strong. And he used to say this. He said, great men and women are just ordinary men and women who wouldn't quit. And I like that. (laughs) Uh, Sometimes you just got to keep on going, right? Well, if you don't mind, could we stand up for the reading of God's Word today as we finish up talking about finishing well? And uh, if you're new with us here today, real simply, we're a Bible-believing church. So 
what we like to do in our three weekend service is just to stand for a moment. It's kind of our way saying, you know what, Lord, whatever you have to say to me from your word today, I'm open to it. Whatever your word says, that's the authority in our lives, so we're going to go with it. And I had just two verses today, not a long one today, just a couple verses, but this is how things kind of wrap up on this project. Nehemiah chapter 6, two verses, verses 15 and 16. So the Bible says this, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days, in just 52 days. Verse 16, And it happened when all our enemies heard of it. And all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Lord, we just ask that you bless this time this morning in the sharing of your word, that, Lord, each and every one of us would be finishers. Lord, help us to be finishers in our walk with you. Help us to be finishers in our families. Help us to be finishers in doing your will while we're here on this earth. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, you can be seated today. (laughs) How many of you know that it's easy to start something, but it is much harder to finish? Uh, Go with me for a minute, because I think many of us have been in this boat. I've probably been in this boat on all of these things I'm about to share, so please feel no conviction. But how many of you have ever started an exercise program and didn't see it through? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been there, done that. I bought the t-shirt on that one. And as a matter of fact, when we, I, I was working out pretty consistently when we came to Canton 10 years ago. And for about the first year and a half I was here, I was getting to the gym and doing what I needed to do. And then one day I just didn't feel like going and I didn't go. And then the next day I didn't go. And the next day I didn't go. And five years later, I did not go. <laughs> but y'all will be proud of me. For the last nine months, I have been mostly regular in my workouts. I say mostly. And uh, hey, thank you very much. Didn't expect that, but thank you. And I've got to be honest with you, I do feel better. My energy levels feel better. I can run with my son in the yard, my kids better. And I, got, I had to have my blood work done a, few, a couple months ago. And I had the best blood work I've had in my adult life. So it's working. So anyways... That had nothing to do with the sermon other than, yeah. Um, But uh, how many of you have ever uh, started a diet? Hey, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to eat better, all right? I have not nailed that one. As a matter of fact, last night I was watching a football game, and uh, I ate a drumstick, not a chicken one. One of those drumsticks, ice cream drumsticks, those things are from heaven. As a matter of fact, I have a hard time eating just one. I've been known to go back a second time. Pray for me, okay? Um, How many of you have ever tried to get on a budget or a spending plan and it just didn't quite work out? Like, hey, you know, this year we're going to get out of debt. You know, this year we're going to pay off our credit card bill. This year we're not going to eat out as much, right? Uh, We say that, uh, but then we don't always follow through with it. For some people, you're like, hey, you know, I'm going to finally finish that degree. I've been trying to get my master's for the last 20 years. I'm going to finally finish it this year or whatever it might be. And you just can't seem to quite get around to finishing that, uh, that thing, whatever it may be. And then, of course, that goes spiritually as well. Uh, like, hey, you know, I'm going to start getting up early and I'm going I'm to read my Bible and pray, you know, every day before I go to work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the one-year Bible this year. I'm going to read my Bible through in a year. And man, January, you're cooking. February, mm, March, you've forgotten all about it, right? Um, but we've all been in those positions where we start things but don't always finish. And I think we're all in the same boat there. But here's what you need to realize if you're following along in the sermon notes today, that our success in life is, is not so much determined by what we start, it's determined by what we finish. So uh, you and I will be remembered not for what we started. You and I will be remembered for actually what we finished Uh, Being a finisher is a very wonderful quality to have as a human being, especially as a follower of Christ. And as a matter of fact, it's actually, um, it's a little sad when you think about it, but it gives comfort as well. Uh, There was a great man of God, his name was Howard Hendricks. And Howard Hendricks is a very respected theologian 
And uh, he was the president of the Dallas uh, Theological Seminary for many years, wonderfully respected man of God, student of God's word. He decided years ago that he was going to do a study. He was going to find the hundred people in the Bible that had the greatest bio- biographical information about them. So he, he, throughout the Bible, he took the characters that had the most written about them, and he studied their life, and he wanted to see how the hundred uh, most people talked about in the Bible finished. And this is how, uh, this, actually the, the culmination of it, I'll kind of give you the ending from the beginning, that two-thirds of the people that he studied did not finish well, sadly. Um, some of them turned to immorality. Some of them drifted from their faith. Uh, Some of them ended their life in a backslidden condition. Let me give you some examples. Um, Noah, you know, Noah was a great man of God and had the faith to build the ark and save mankind. But at the end of his life, we read about him getting drunk. Uh, Samson fell for the temptation of women. Absalom, the son of David, fell to pride and ambition. Uh, Solomon, another son of David, fell into uh, having multiple wives. The Bible said, don't have all of these wives. Have, have one wife, but he had multiple wives and they led his heart astray to foreign gods. And his son ended up splitting the kingdom. Eli, who was a priest of God, he was the high priest. He didn't raise his kids well. While he served God faithfully, he didn't raise his kids. And that ended up being the ruin of, of him and, and what God was trying to do in that moment. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, they started well, but they fell in love with money and they ended up dying. Damos, who was a gentleman that traveled with Paul in Paul's missionary journeys. Damos was a, a, a great close friend of Paul and he ended up forsaking the faith and abandoning Paul and walking away and dying an atheist. And so you can see in Scripture, I don't say that to depress you, but I say that to say that human nature doesn't always see things through to the end. As a matter of fact, when you think about people who did it well, there's one name that I think would come to most of us today, and that would be the great Billy Graham. Um, I, I think Billy Graham, you know, he did it right. He did it well. Um, you know, he... He actually he just died back in 2018. He was 99 years old, and uh, man, what a what an incredible guy! In fact, some people say I don't know if this is true or not, but but some have said that next to the Apostle Paul, he is responsible for winning more people to Christ than anyone else in history. And so, what a, what a great man of God! I think very few of us could dispute that. When you look at his life, though, what's interesting is when. His ministry really took off and began. It would have been about 1945 when World War II was ending. Uh, He was not the only young gun out there preaching the gospel. There was two other guys at the same time preaching the gospel. One gentleman's name was Chuck Templeton, and the other one's name was Bron Clifford. And these three guys were kind of going out. They were holding crusades. They were doing revivals. They were preaching the gospel. And the other two gentlemen were actually drawing bigger crowds than Billy Graham. In fact, some people said that Chuck Templeton was a much better preacher, much better speaker. People enjoyed listening to him much more than Billy Graham. Uh, That Bron Clifford was another guy who was drawing much bigger crowds than Billy Graham was. But the interesting thing was not how these three men started, but how the three men finished. Uh, As a a matter of fact, um, Chuck Templeton ended up Uh, over the course of his life, kind of straying from the faith, compromising the faith, and then forsaking it. He died died an atheist. He went into uh, media and TV and all that kind of stuff and ended up dying an atheist. And then Bron Clifford was a man who strayed from God as well. And sadly and tragically, he died of liver failure from alcoholism when he was in his 30s. Isn't that sad? Two men that were that were in some ways maybe more talented than Billy Graham. They started great, but they didn't finish. It's kind of like running a race. Uh, I don't like running long distance. I don't know about you. I was always fairly fast as a kid. I could sprint fast, but long distance, I don't know. But how many of you know, if if you're running long distance, if you start out real fast, you might burn yourself out and not be able to finish. And so it's not how you start ultimately at the end of the day. It's how you finish. And here's what we need to know, that finishing well is not an accident. People that live their lives for God, people like a Billy Graham, 
people that, that really, people that you know in your life, maybe you have a loved one or somebody that you respect and look up to, and, and they've been able to do it. Maybe you had a parent or a grandparent that, man, they did it right, you know? Uh, they, they held on to their faith. They, they lived for God. They did his will. They made an impact in the world. I can promise you that anyone that you and I look up to that did that, that was no accident. It takes effort. It takes courage. It takes perseverance in order to really live out the plan that God has for you and I. As a matter of fact, there'll be lots of opportunities for you and I to get distracted, you know, to be lured away by the sinful pleasures of life to be lured away into lust and immorality, to be lured away into chemical addictions, to be lured away into just hobbies and things that that are not really of value in our lives. And so it's so easy. The attacks, the challenges come our way when we're trying to serve God and we get distracted by those things. But here's what you need to know. God is the ultimate finisher. He always finishes what he starts. That's what I love about God. If God says something, he's going to do it. You can take it to the bank. He always finishes what he starts. And you can see that in the life of Jesus so beautifully. In fact, when Jesus was in his earthly ministry in uh, John chapter 4, it's kind of interesting. There's this one story where the disciples were all eating and they asked Jesus, they said, hey, Jesus, we're all eating. You want some food? And Jesus' answer was really interesting. He said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish and finish his work. That didn't mean Jesus didn't eat and didn't value eating. But what it meant was the number one thing he was living for was to fulfill his father's will for his life. He came here to accomplish a mission and he was focused on the mission. He said, more than my daily bread, I'm after doing my Father's will. In fact, you can actually see that too at the end of his ministry in John 17 when Jesus is praying for all of us. He's praying for all the disciples and anybody who would ever believe. The Message Bible says it really cool. It says it like this. It says, I, Jesus, glorified you, Father on earth, by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. Man, if we could all do that, right? If you and I could end our life Imagine you and I being on our deathbed. I know it's sad to think about, but imagine you and I being on our deathbed and being able to have that comfort knowing, you know what, Lord? I did what you called me to do. I lived my life well. I did it. I I finished my race, kind of like the Apostle Paul. Remember the Apostle Paul, when he came to the end of his life, he realized he was going to be martyred for the faith. And the Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have run the course. I have finished the race. Like Paul, he, he, went, to, uh, he went to heaven knowing that, that he did it. He, he ran the race. He fulfilled his purpose. And so Jesus on the cross, what did Jesus say? What were his final words? It is what? Finished. He was able to finish. And God calls you and I to be finishers. And so when you look at Nehemiah, he is another an incredible example of somebody who was a finisher. I mean, imagine this. He, he's in Persia as the cupbearer to the king. He had a pretty cushy job. He finds out about what's happening in, with his people in Jerusalem and that the walls are broken down and the people are sitting ducks and they're in despair and God's name is in reproach. And he prays and God gives him this vision to go and God gives him favor and he goes and rebuilds these walls. Look what the Bible says in our verse today. Verse 15, so the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in just 52 days. He and all the people were able to rally together and finish those walls. Think about that. That was just nine months after he got the report. So here he was. He's, he's in Persia. He gets the report about these walls. And so from the time he starts praying, he prays for four months. He travels for a couple months because it took a long time to go a thousand miles back in those days. And then in 52 days, they rebuild the wall. So in nine months time, the impossible suddenly became possible. They did what people thought could never have happened. And he did it in concert with God. In fact, it's been said this like this, that the true great forces came together to make the miracle of the wall happen. It was the power of God and it was the determination of Nehemiah and the people. It was two great forces, one just one. Yes, it was the power of God. Uh, had this not been God's will, 
it would have never happened. Had God not given him favor with the king of Persia, this would have never happened. Had not God not given him an anointing to cast the vision with the people, it would have never happened. Had God not provided all the materials to rebuild the walls, it would have never happened. I mean, obviously, this project would have never happened had it not been for God. And if you say only God, you'd be right, but it's not completely right because, listen, God uses people. So without Nehemiah and the people doing their part, this thing wasn't going to happen because God's work in the world is always in concert with people. God has a will. God has everything we need, but he needs willing vessels that are willing to operate and do what he called them to do. And that's what you see happening here. It's like the positive and the, the negative of parts of a battery cable. You can't get by with just one. It's when both of them are connected that you have power. When you have the power of God working in concert with determined people who say, we are going to do what you called us to do, regardless of how difficult it seems, regardless of how impossible it seems, we are going to do it. And, and that's the beauty of this story. And so what I want to do is give you three things. I only got a few minutes this morning, but I want to give you three things that all of us can apply to our lives. Because God calls us all to be finishers, right? That we want to walk with Christ to the day we go to heaven, right? Right? We want to have great families, great marriages, godly kids. We want our family tree to be godly, don't we? We want to know that when we die, we did what God called us to do, that we fulfilled God's plan for our life. We want those three things. I think all of us can agree. Well, here's three things that will help you and I to fulfill that in our life, and we can learn it from Nehemiah. And here's number one, and that's that Nehemiah's strength to finish was found in his prayer life. Nehemiah is a man of prayer. That's the one thing that you can see about him. What made him so special was his dependence on God. Right in the beginning, what does he do? The first chapter of Nehemiah, he's praying and fasting for four months for his people. In fact, there are 14 different recorded prayers of Nehemiah throughout the scriptures. So when Nehemiah saw a need, he prayed. When Nehemiah had a need, he prayed. When he was criticized, he prayed. When he was attacked, he prayed. When there was an opportunity, he prayed. Nehemiah always sought God. Because listen, everything you and I need, I know this may sound basic, but sometimes we need reminded of it. Everything you and I need in our life to be great husbands, to be great wives, to be great parents, to be great men and women of God, to excel in whatever God's called you to do, even in your job, your career. You know, if God's called you to that in your career, God can help you in that. That all of the access to the strength, to the wisdom, to the favor, all of that comes from God through prayer. So when you and I pray, we have access to all the resources of heaven to come to our aid to accomplish God's will for our life. And so you see that in Nehemiah's life. In fact, in chapter 6 today, again, he's being attacked. They're trying to rebuild these walls. They have enemies all around them. The enemies are trying to criticize them, and then they're, then they're trying to attack them. But look what the Bible says here in verse 9. For they were trying to make us afraid. So that was their tactic now. We're going to make them so afraid that they're not going to be able to work because of fear saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. But look at what Nehemiah says. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. They're telling me my hands are going to be weak. God, I'm believing you today to strengthen my hands. You know, some of you might be afraid right now. Maybe you're doing something that seems beyond you. Maybe it seems like your marriage is never going to be healed. Maybe it seems like your kids are always going to be wayward. Maybe it seems like what God's called you to do seems impossible. Maybe you even feel a little bit fearful today. Listen, God can help you overcome fear. When you and I pray, he can strengthen our hands for the work that's laid before us. And here's what I love about Nehemiah. When he was attacked, when he was going through adversity, he never engaged his enemies physically. He only dealt with them in prayer. That's the beautiful thing you see about Nehemiah. He, he never engaged uh, anybody physically. He always prayed and he realized something. Remember what we learned in our Suit Up series a couple months ago? That the battle that we face, a lot of times when you're having trouble with people or groups of people, it's not always just a, a relational thing. It's not always just that. But sometimes it's deeper than that. In fact, look what the Bible says right here 
in Ephesians, we learned this a couple months ago. Now our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Listen, when you see what's happening in our world today, you see what's happening in the, wor- in the Middle East, you see what's happening around the world today, folks, listen, that is more than just not getting along. That's, there's spiritual roots to all of that. And Nehemiah knew that when he, was, um, when he was facing his own challenges, he always prayed. And here's what you know about Nehemiah. When it came to his enemies, he never came down to their level. He never felt like he needed to answer his critics. I don't know if you've ever had a critic before. I've had a couple of them. Um, doesn't matter what you say or what you do, it's never going to be right. You can, you'll never be able, you know, your friends, you'll never have to, you know, when you have a good friend, it doesn't matter what you say or do. They're always going to be there for you. But a critic's always going to be a critic. You'll never please your critics. And Nehemiah knew that. He never got down to his critics' level. He never, never went there. He never attacked anybody. In fact, I heard somebody say years ago, and I don't even know who said it. You may have heard this before, but I thought it, this is a great principle, and Nehemiah lived this out. You know what the best answer is to your critics? Massive success. That's how you answer your critics. The best answer for your critics is just massive success. They can say what they want. They can do what they want. But I'm going to focus on what God's called me to do and like it or lump it. I'm just going to keep on keeping on. And that's what Nehemiah did. He kept on keeping on. And his critics ended up at the end of the day being ashamed for the way that they treated him. Here's number two. And that is that Nehemiah's strength to finish was found in his focus. So he was a man of prayers and one. So if you want to be a good finisher, you got to be a man or woman of prayer. Number two is you have to be a person that's focused. So here's what Nehemiah's enemies realized. They're like, okay, we're trying to criticize them. It's not working. We're trying to ridicule them. That's not working. We're trying to threaten them. That's not working. We've even tried to attack them. That's not working. Four strategies. None of them worked. So they came up with a fifth one. And they said, well, this is what we'll do. We'll distract Nehemiah from the work. So they kept trying to come to him, and they kept trying to get him to come down off the wall so he would meet with them, and they could get him all embroiled in all this controversy and keep him from doing what God had called him to do, and that was rebuild the walls. And so they came to him, and I love his reply. In fact, this is a very famous scripture. In fact, if you're an Andy Stanley fan, I I appreciate Andy Stanley This is his life verse. (laughs) Um, I love the way he, he answered. He said, I am carrying on a great project and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? (laughs) He said, I'm doing a great work, folks. I know what you're up to, and I'm doing a great work. Why should this work stop while I get off this wall and, and get down there and caught up with you? And so the idea was, Nehemiah knew who he was. And Nehemiah knew what he was called to do. And he didn't allow his enemies to distract him from what he was called to do. That many of us sometimes find ourselves getting distracted from what God has called you and I to do. Let me ask you that question today. Let me, let me ask you this. Today, you don't have to answer this to anyone but yourself. Just answer this in your own. You don't even have to answer it to your spouse today. Just to, unless you want to in your own brain, would you say today that on November the 12th, 2023 at 1028 a.m., uh, you are walking in God's will for your life. You are focused on what God, you know what God's called you to do with your life and you're actively doing it. Could you, can you answer that today? That yes, I, I know what God has called me to do and I'm actively doing it in the various areas of my life today. Um, if, you're, if you don't know that, we can help you find that. Don't, don't get freaked out by that. But the idea is we want to know what that is. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we talked about fighting for what matters most? At the end of your life and the end of my life, what's going to matter most? Dr. Roger Breyer gave us the answer to that. Remember this? Number one is the person of Jesus Christ. When you and I are laying on our deathbed, getting ready to go to heaven... What's going to matter most is my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what matters most, first and foremost. Secondly, is the people that God has placed in my life. They matter. Your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your friends. Even the unsaved people that God has given you influence over. 
those people matter. At the end of your life, you're probably not wishing you would have worked more. At the end of your life, there's other things that people regret at the end of their life. It's Jesus, it's the people, and then the purposes of God. Did I finish God's will? Did I, can I say it like Paul? I ran my race. I finished it. I crossed the finish line. I'm good. I'm ready. That, at the end of the day, is what all of us are going to want. At the end of your life, I promise you, that's what we're all going to want, is those three things in our lives. And in order to do that and fulfill that, we have to be <laughs> relentless in our focus. Because notice, they didn't just try to do this to Nehemiah, Nehemiah once, but look what the Bible says right here in verse 4. But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Every time they tried to lure him down, he'd give them the same answer. One, two, three, four, he just kept giving them the same answer. I am not going to be distracted. And sometimes we can be distracted by good things. Sometimes you can be distracted by great opportunities. Hey, it's a great opportunity, but it may not be in God's will for you. We can be distracted by a lot of things in life. And so the idea is, what has God called me to do in this season of my life, and am I focused on it? And then lastly, here's number three, and that is Nehemiah's strength to finish, okay? So he was a man of prayer. He was a man of focus. So prayer, focus, and here's the last one, persistence. He didn't give up on what God called him to do. Remember chapter four, how difficult it got for them? Look what the Bible says in chapter four. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. So the battle got so fierce that the people couldn't work with two hands. They actually had to hold a weapon with one hand and a hammer with the other hand. Y'all might remember a couple of weeks ago when I had my hammer and my sword that we don't fight physically, we fight spiritually. So we pray and we work and we pray and we work and we pray and we work and we keep moving forward regardless of how difficult it is, regardless of how hard it is, regardless of the tax and the frustrations, we keep on keeping on. In fact, one of my favorite verses is in, especially about persistence is in 1 Corinthians 15. You might want to make a note of this, maybe make a note of it in your notes, but this might be for somebody today. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior and excelling and doing more than enough in the service of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile, it's never wasted or of, of no purpose. So the Bible says, if you know you're doing God's work, then keep on doing it and don't give up. If you know God's called you to raise up those kids, which you know he did, keep loving them, keep disciplining them, keep putting the word into them, keep praying for them, keep on doing it. Whatever ministry thing God has called you to, God's called us all to some form of ministry. Do it and keep on doing it. And when you feel tired and you know it's God's will, keep on trucking and do not give up doing what God's called you to do. Because what is the promise at the end? What you and I do is never in vain. When you and I get to the end of our lives, when you and I get to the end of our life and we go to heaven, the only thing that's going to matter are those three things. Did I know Jesus? Did I love the people in my life? Are people in heaven because of me? And did I fulfill God's will? At the end of the day, that's what matters. And if you're doing it, Keep on doing it. Here's the reward. This is what happens when you and I focus. Here's what happens when we finish well. Let me just give you a couple things as we wrap it up. Lives are changed. Lives are changed. Two years in, year and a half into our time here, I've shared with you many times before, Christy and I almost threw in the towel. And I'm so glad we didn't. Because looking back 10 years now, the lives that have been touched what the Lord has done, when I look at the future that's set before us, it would have been really easy to walk away. But I'm so glad we didn't because we have story after story after story after story of God changing lives. And um, that's what we live for. So when you fulfill God's will, when you do it, when you finish well, guess what? You can change your family tree. Think about that. Generations after we're gone, and your family might be serving God because you finished well. My grandmother finished well 
And all of her kids and her grandkids love Jesus to this day. And now going to the next generation because she did it well. Here's the second thing that happens. And that is God is glorified. So here's how God answered Nehemiah's critics. He didn't have to answer his critics. God did it for him. Look what the Bible says. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. So in that moment, everybody, all those enemies were like, whoa, that's a miracle. That could have never happened. That was God. And God got the glory. When you and I finish well, lives are changed, our family tree is changed, and God gets the glory for what he does. And then lastly, God will reward us. When you and I get to heaven, we're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Remember the Apostle Paul? He said, I finished the race. I fought the good fight. Now there's laid out for me rewards. He was looking forward to the rewards. Listen, it's going to be worth it all someday. Every, every hour you put in to serve somebody else, every prayer you pray for your kids, every moment you take your wife out on a date night and love her, tell her how beautiful she is, kiss her, hug her, buy her nice stuff, all that stuff. It's going to be worth it, right? Ladies putting up with that grump of a man, it's going to be worth it someday, right? Serving God, it's going to be worth it someday. There used to be an old song we used to sing, it's going to be worth it all. Yeah, it's going to be worth it. Let me close with the final story. My fifth closing and I am done now. Here it is. 1968. I wasn't around then. Maybe some, maybe some of you were around in 1968. I finally have a date that I don't, wasn't here for. 1968, the Olympics. Some of you might remember that. They were in Mexico. There was a young Tanzanian runner, a young man. His name was John Stephen Akwari. He was a marathon runner from Tanzania. Very talented young man. And he came to Mexico to run the marathon. What he didn't realize is when he ran the marathon, the altitude was higher in, in where he was running it in Mexico than where he, he trained. And, and he was having trouble with his muscles cramping, but he was pushing through the cramps. And then what happened was partway through the race, he got tangled up with some other runners and he fell and he, he did some real damage to his knee, dislocated something, tore something. He was cut, he hurt his shoulder. But instead of quitting the race, he, he just hobbled along. So for miles, he just, he just kept hobbling through, but he refused to quit. So finally, by evening time, the runners that were finishing the marathon had come into the stadium and people were cheering and 75 people started the race, 57 finished. He was the very last one of the 57 to finish. And when he came in, it was an hour after the guy that won the race came in. A whole hour later he came. In fact, half the crowd was gone by the time he showed up. The lights were even getting dimmed in the stadium. But this precious young man hobbled across the finish line. And he was being interviewed after the race and they said, why did you finish? Why did you do it? I mean, you were hurt. You had every reason to quit. And I love his answer. He looked back at the announcer and he said this. He said, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish a race. And I finished the race. Amen. Can we stand up on our feet this morning? I don't know about you, but if I'm hobbling across the finish line, I'm going to finish. I've made a determination that whatever God wants for me and his church and my family, he can count me in. Sometimes it's discouraging, sometimes it's frustrating, but if you keep on keeping on, it will be worth it all, amen? So if you're tired today, if you're frustrated today, if you feel like you're on the losing team, can you just take a moment and put your trust in God? He who called you will be faithful to you. Could we worship him for just a moment? And I trust in God, my Savior. Let's go to the bridge. I 
exalt the Lord. Sing it out today. Say, and I saw the Lord and he heard and he answered. My faith is firm. You're my shield, my defender. The battles are the Lord's. The victory is yours. That's why. Father, we just come before you today and we thank you. The Lord, you've given us the, the privilege of knowing you and serving you and following after you. In the midst of all the trials of this life and the pain of this life, Lord, we thank you that we get to look forward to heaven where we will be with you forever. And Lord, I just say a special prayer today for everyone under the sound of my voice. Those that are here, that are watching, those that are online, that, that, are, that are tuned in online. Father, I, I just pray this morning for each and every person under the sound of my voice that God, divine encouragement would come into their hearts. I, I pray for those that are discouraged today. I just have a sense that some people are discouraged today. Maybe even somebody watching online, you've tried, you've tried, you've tried. It keeps coming up empty. It's been setback after setback. I feel to encourage you, keep on keeping on. If you know you're in the will of God, eventually the fruit will come. I pray for marriages to be healed. I pray for wayward children to be to come home, Lord. I pray for ministries to flourish. I pray for breakthrough to happen. Lord, we just believe you for that today. Lord, we thank you for it. Even for those watching, God, even those in ministry watching, that they would be inspired and encouraged today in Jesus' name. And with your heads bowed and eyes closed before we wrap it up today, maybe you're here or maybe you're watching online. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. That's where it all begins. The person of Jesus Christ matters most. What you and I choose to do with him will determine our eternity. If you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you don't have to worry about this. But if you're here and you've never done that, or maybe you did it one time but drifted away, can I invite you to a relationship with God that will bless you in ways you could never imagine? And if you're ready to make Christ the Lord of your life today, I'm gonna ask everybody to pray whether you need this or not. That way just everyone can feel comfortable to pray along. But if you're here, if you're watching online and you feel to pray with me today, could we all just pray this together? Could we just say, Jesus, thank you for finishing your work on the cross. Thank you for purchasing my salvation. I put my faith in you today as my personal Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, and amen. God bless y'all. I hope you have an awesome day, and whatever you do, don't give up. Let's all finish well. Amen.